So we're talking a lot about the cult nature of uh, partisan politics these days and how we're trying to break free of that. It, it's taken me a long time to get out of it. I was guilty of it. I know a lot of people have been guilty of it, but I think that a lot of people are waking up to what a scam the partisan political system in the United States is. And I want to show you this video from a TikToker who it was shared on Twitter. And forgive me for not giving you credit. Uh, if you if you ping me, I will in the uh, cut when I cut this out. But this is such a great breakdown of what's going on in American politics. And it's just, again, from an average guy on TikTok. Um, but watch this. This is fantastic. And let's talk about it. I hope you'll let me explain, because as we navigate the tricky intersectional ethics of the upcoming 2024 election and beyond, it's important that we begin to understand this in our bones. 50 years ago, the U.S. had two political parties, Republicans and Democrats. Both had genuine public support, and both platforms held some public appeal. And then the right wing realized that there was unimaginable money to be made from corporate campaign funding. So they abandoned their entire platform and dedicated themselves completely to allowing the exploitation of the environment and the working class to give every single penny to the ultra-rich. Pay that was the beginning of the Reagan era. I don't know if you know that. Um, they, my mind has been blown on the Nixon thing. We'll get into that on a whole other level. Tucker talked about it on Joe Rogan, but Reagan was the, the beginning of the puppet era. Really? I think, um, the true beginning did really well, but there was no way they were going to win elections with that as a platform because it amounted to a giant middle finger to the working class and their voter base. So they needed to mobilize a new voter base. They looked at a few options and settled on evangelical fundamentalist Christians who were previously pretty apolitical. In order to buy their votes, the Republican Party turned on a dime in the 1980s and became rabidly pro-life. Before this, the Republicans were openly pro-choice because abortion is a personal right and they were the party advocating personal rights. This marked the start of the modern culture wars, where the right invents boogeymen to terrify their base into ignoring the fact that their entire platform is basically steal all your money and give it to the rich while destroying <laughs> the environment we live in. The Democrats quickly followed suit. They call that trickle-down economics. I don't know if you remember that, or Reaganomics. Suit, starting with Clinton. They also abandoned any actual representation of their base for corporate cash grabs, including massively lucrative arms deals and warmongering in order to funnel billions through the Pentagon into their corporate funders' pockets. So the only two major political parties in the most powerful country in the history of the world both completely sold out to corporate interests some 30 to 40 years ago, which has led to an ever-widening gap between public opinion and legislation. For example, polling shows that some 70% of Americans have wanted some form of universal health care for decades, but it's barred from even being seriously discussed. So just so you know, too, this guy is on TikTok. His, name, his handle is at Watchful Coyote, so I'll just keep this up while he... Does this incredible break citizens down. of the U.S. are shockingly aligned on most major issues. We all want the rich to pay taxes, not to watch our neighbors and families die from easily preventable medical issues, living wages, fair elections, breathable air, and not bombing of babies. Corporations want the exact opposite, or more accurately, they want the record-breaking profits they can extract from the opposite. This creates a real quandary for both Republicans and Democrats alike. How do you continue to get votes while aggressively working against everything your voters want? You already know the answer. They stage a farce where they pretend to be bitter enemies, and like any abuser, they both claim that they are the only ones who can keep you safe from the other. The Republicans pretend that they are the only thing preventing straight white Christians from being hunted for sport by hordes of black and brown trans drug dealers screaming pronouns and making up There it is. The Democrats pretend that they are the only ones who can save you from the coal-guzzling fascists literally storming the Capitol. So this is the one thing I think he gets a little bit wrong, but I'll let it slide. The fact that one boogeyman is totally fictional and the other is very real doesn't change. Yeah, one is totally fictional and the other is... There are elements of truth to both of those boogeymen, but they are largely overplayed for the sake of dividing us. And I, it makes me a little sad that he buys the like insurrectionist narrative, but whatever. Change their tactical exploitation and the presentation of themselves as your only hope at all. And they've gotten really good at this dance. They do a great job at it now. They look genuinely enraged at each other as they denounce the other side of the aisle while all of them vote unanimously for the same tax cuts for the rich and blow... You know what, though? I will watch Full Coyote if you happen to see this, my friend. His, his name is Jack, I guess. Look at my pinned tweet, because I think it'll change your mind on the boogeyman thing. The military budgets and genocides that line their own uh, their funders' pockets. The Republicans have it easy. Their platform of culture war has no relationship to their corporate funders. So when they get into office, they can do most of what they say they will. They'll criminalize yep. abortion, defund social services, cut taxes, but only on the rich, never for you. Institute a brutal police state, terrorize immigrants and LGBTQ people. The Democrats have a real problem, though. Their nominal platform is at odds with their corporate sponsors. So they do the only logical thing from that position. They intentionally lose. Yes. Yes. 
this is the exact reason you constantly see the like we don't know we we had complete control of all three branches of government in uh the obama era and we couldn't we just couldn't pass good policy because the republicans oh those darn republicans Every time they make a catch, win an election, they intentionally fumble the ball. We're all so used to seeing this farcical dance that we can't even really register it anymore, but the Democrats have had the Senate, House, and Presidency simultaneously multiple times in the last few decades. At any one of those times, they could have actually made change. They could have codified Roe versus Wade. They could have passed legislation eliminating all student debt. They could have cut military spending, taxed the rich, passed universal health care. They could have capped emissions and maintained a livable environment. Our country and world could be very, very different than it is. It really doesn't have to be like this. But if they did those things, they would then gain massive public support and actually run the country, but they would it really doesn't have to be like this. It really doesn't have to be like this. Would lose all their corporate funding. So that's not actually what they want. So they keep this incredibly fragile balance, where since the Clinton years, where the Democrats sold out, the balance of power has been carefully maintained at almost exactly 50-50, giving both parties the ability to point the finger and blame the other for not getting anything done. Nailing it. It didn't used to be like that. The party that better represented the will of the population used to just win and then do what the people wanted. Like the 75th Congress, some 90 years ago, was 344 to 88. Because the Democrats, who held the 344, maintained a 95% tax on the rich and actually subsidized social services and education. If today's Democrats simply adopted the platform of their own party from 90 years ago, they would win every election in a landslide. But they actively don't want to win. For many of us millennials, this was really driven home by the 2016 election cycle. Polls were crystal clear. In every single poll, Bernie Sanders beat Trump by double digits and Hillary Clinton lost to Trump. We all saw this too. It, like I know a lot of my peers in online are from the Bernie movement because I was a volunteer for, for Sanders, not because of anything other than I wanted healthcare for my fellow man. I've, I've seen too many people become sick from it, but I love that this guy gets this because over the years, we've kind of just slowly forgotten about all this. The DNC pulled out all the stops. They lied, cheated, stole so much in order to force Sanders out and put Clinton up as the candidate that it was impossible not to see it. It looked insane to many of us. We felt crazy. I remember. Yes. Okay. Willie, I wanted to highlight this comment, Willie, because I was just thinking about this and I was going to make this point when this guy's done, but I'm going to make it now. This is why there are massive college protests. Just vote. Get out and vote. It is so fucking clear that that does absolutely nothing. The only thing that actually changes the dynamic is real grassroots protest. We saw it with the civil rights movement. We saw it with women's rights. We've seen it with gay rights. Eventually, the mainstream comes around to the grassroots, just like with news. I talked about this the other day with indie news and indie music. Indie news is like indie music now because... You know, there's cool stuff popping on the underground, but you don't get it in the mainstream until like a year later. And news is like that now. And this right here is why, again, the protest movement is such a good thing to see being reignited, you know. And cheers to the call. Anyway, let me let this guy finish. Literally watching them kick Sanders delegates out for asking questions that they didn't want to answer at the Democratic National Con uh, Convention in Maine. I remember watching them shut down polling places where Sanders had strong leads. All the things that the MAGA thinks happened in the 2020 election, the DNC literally did and didn't even bother to hide in 2016. Yes. So I've talked about this before, too. I got banned from uh, Twitter for a week because I said something that they deemed hate speech against Chris Matthews because he, he was so upset that Bernie had won some some primary. And I said something. It was a metaphor. But I'm not going to say it here because I don't want to get my stream shut off. But all of the stuff that they did in 2020, all of the stuff they did to Trump, they did to Bernie first. He Russia likes him. He's a misogynist. All his followers are angry white guys. All the same stuff. They were taken to court for it, and they didn't even deny that they rigged the primary. They just said, hey, we're a private company. We're under zero obligation to run fair elections. We can nominate whoever we want. The voting is just a farce. That was their legal argument, and they won with it. I remember hearing people scream at the DNC officials, do you want to lose? And slowly understanding that, yeah, that was exactly what they wanted. They would literally rather lose with Clinton than win with Sanders. because They, fun they were able to fundraise like mad with Trump. Every day it was a new scandal and a new uh, you know, crisis with Trump.
my inbox was full of uh because Sanders sold his list to you know the DNC. And so I get texts now from Gavin Newsom and all kinds of scumbags. When they lose, they can then say, gosh darn it, we tried, but they won this round. Please donate more. They get to look like the good guys who keep trying, but just keep getting beaten down by the forces of fascism and racism and hate. As losers, they're noble victims. But when they win, they have real problems, like what we're seeing now with Biden, where they have to try and hide the fact that they are also the forces of fascism and racism and hate. If Trump had won, he'd likely be doing the exact same thing, but it would be normal. We'd all expect it, and the DNC would fundraise like crazy. When a Democrat commits though, we're supposed to see it as atypical. Unflinchingly committing genocide is supposed to read as, oh, a little oopsie from an otherwise ethical humanitarian Democratic leader. The fact that the Republican platform doesn't interfere with their corporate interests and therefore they can enact the policies they promise to, while the Democrats have to constantly appear to fumble and fail in their oh-so-genuine efforts to create change, has of course led to the rightward drift of U.S. politics over the last decades, to the point where Republican elected officials are now openly saying out loud that we should kill all power while the House just voted near unanimously that anyone who says we should not commit genocide must be anti-Semitic. That shift is noteworthy. If any politician had stood up and publicly said that we should kill all of a given race 50 years ago, they would have rightfully been called a Nazi and lost all public credulity. Today, that's accepted on the floor of a state house, while opposing genocide is condemned and literally censured. That's pretty intense, and it's like that across the board. The only thing that... Bill Maher will make a video where he talks down to you for protesting that matters in political discourse is controlling the parameters of the narrative what is outside the bounds on each side if you control these two bookends then the content of what is said in between them becomes wholly irrelevant both bookends have been steadily shifting to the right for a long time to the point where that's called an overton window for those of you who may not know the more you know now right-wing politicians openly advocate ethnic cleansing and left-wing politicians just quietly fund ethnic cleansing and anything to the left of funding ethnic cleansing is literally censured remember how a hundred years ago the democrats controlled like 80 percent of congress and they taxed the rich at 95 percent in a way that gave the u.s the strongest economy in the history of the world now if any elected official is crazy enough to suggest that the rich should pay any taxes at all they're labeled as communists and laughed they get apacked out of the room so I paid more taxes than Jeff Bezos last year. The cost of living is through the roof, federal minimum wage is still seven twenty five, and we're watching our tax dollars bomb babies. But the Democrats, who are currently the ones bombing babies, are our saviors. And if we just vote for them a little bit more, then they'll save us all. Most notable in all of this is that if anyone speaks up Vote harder. Who actually represents the will of the American people, they're mocked and driven out of the conversation. So people like Claudia de la Cruz or Cornel West are effectively barred from any presence in the main Well, to be fair here. I like Cla- Claudia de la Cruz, but Cornel West kind of played himself. So, but we won't go into that right now. Media, or if they are covered, it's as an anomaly and immediately condemned as stealing votes from the real candidates. Notice that framing. This is true. The, they're doing it to all of them. It's not that Biden or Trump are losing through their complete failure to represent anything like what the people want. It's that anyone who represents what the people want is stealing votes from them. If you'd like to understand the mechanisms and expressions of this political narrative of control better, I can't recommend Chomsky enough. Since reading his masterwork, Manufacturing Consent, a Propaganda Model of the Media, I have never seen the world the same way. That book is dense, but he covers the same content in a much more digestible fashion in the 1988 CBC Massey Lectures titled Necessary Illusion. But you get the idea. Check out Watchful Coyote on uh, TikTok. This was a great piece that he did.